Hello again. <laughs> uh, we have like um, half an hour, so I'm open for any, any questions, so please ask. Oh. Yes. Sorry, the last part of the question. Also, in light of the recent revelation that North, uh, China may be planning to build refugee hmm. camps alongside the North Korean border. Hmm. <coughs> okay. Um, as I said, uh, for a divided country, the um, seeking unification is our fundamental interest and fundamental goal. We believe uh, we'll have to achieve this goal, and we understand that. Um, um, for that to happen, we'll have to have a strategic communications both with the United States and with China and of course with other countries. So a Korea's diplomacy fundamentally has a task of a nurturing support basis uh, in the US and China and other countries for a Korea's goal of unification. And for several years Korean government um, the uh, hope to um, initiate uh, very in-depth strategic consultations with China. And uh, we, Moon Jae-in government, I'm sure, has the same kind of policy. And um, the, what kind of unified Korea uh, we'll assume is something that um, Korean people will have to decide on, but before that, we having the consultation with China will always help. That did not materialize for obvious reasons. That is, if it is reported one day that China is having that kind of unification talks with South Korea, then the China-North Korean relations will suffer a lot. So <laughs> it's difficult to um, structure these kind of consultations. I don't say that we don't have the consultations, but we have, we'll have to be very, very discreet. And I suspect that US and China have similar talks. And your question is about the final shape of the unified Korea. Um, I would like to have my country maintain some strategic uh, space where we can choose still. So I don't want to be too definite. But suffice it to say at the moment that Korean government's basic policy, a continuing policy, is to maintain the alliance with the United States even after the unification. And this policy was not made, was not pronounced by conservative government. Actually, this policy was pronounced by President Kim Dae-jung. He is a liberal president. And he said that even after the unification, Korea, it's Korea's interest to maintain the alliance with the United States. Now, we saw what happened to Germany when they were unified. We believe that given the job, Korea's diplomats will be uh, resourceful enough to structure a, um, a process in which uh, we both maintain the alliance, but at the same time, uh, this unified Korea is not hostile at all to China. And we have, uh, except for North Korean problem, China and Republic of Korea have so much in common, and we have so many common interests to pursue. So I'm confident that we'll find a way. And 
given the opportunity, but um, we'll have to be very discreet. About the refugee camps, same thing. Um, I do not know whether this, this report is accurate or not. It was reported by one of the China's local media, and it's not there today. It was taken down. So, and Chinese government doesn't say anything to confirm or deny this report. But um, my guess is that as a prudent local government, um, you know, it's, um, it makes sense to begin planning for building refugee camps, which is a huge concern for China as we know it. So in short, I would say that um, uh, to be able to, to try to solve the North Korean nuclear problem and to be able to try to um, the, um, the, uh, build a path to unification, China uh, is a, one of the most important players and Korean government has an interest in establishing an in-depth strategic communication with China. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, towards the end about the visit that um, former President Carter, the meeting that he had with uh, Kim Il-sung. Um, uh, particularly given um, President Trump's uh, sort of reluctance to even entertain the idea of opening a dialogue with mm. Kim Jong-un, um, do you think that a sort of meeting between uh, another senior official such as you know, former President Carter did, uh, sort of another senior meeting like that with a uh, Korean diplomat, North Korean diplomat could help to ease the tension slightly? Okay, um, first of all, as a matter of fact, when former President Carter decided to visit North Korea in June 1994, actually uh, President Clinton didn't like the idea at all. He really hated the idea. Nonetheless, President Carter, being President Carter, decided to visit Pyongyang and um, on top of that, after meeting with Kim Il-sung, President Carter uh, called in a quote-unquote fake news media, that's CNN actually, <laughs> so called in CNN and announced from Pyongyang that um, now we have an agreement. That is, number one, North Korea agreed to stop these proliferation activities. Number two, North Korea agreed to resume negotiations with the United States. And number three, North Korean leader, in addition, agreed to meet with South Korean president. And when this news was broadcast by CNN from Pyongyang, actually President Clinton and any of the senior officials in Washington, D.C. and Seoul did not have any advance information. So we saw, they saw the news on TV and knew it for the first time. <laughs> Uh, government doesn't like surprises, <laughs> that, those, those kinds of surprises at all. But, um, but um, that's what happened, so that, that's a fact. Now, the um, um, sending an envoy, opening up a clandestine or talks, open talks, whatever, so any kind of communication. Communication is important and necessary. And I do not oppose opening up communication at all. What's at stake at the moment is that um, if, uh, or unless, unless we have commitment from North Korea to go to do away with nuclear weapons, to give away nuclear weapons, not now, but sometime in the future at least, and then just open up negotiations, and we'll probably end up uh, negotiating about freeze, uh, and in return, we'll have to give away something. So, uh, um, for President Trump, and uh, before him, President Obama, 
and before him all other U.S. presidents, and all the Korean presidents for that matter, uh, cannot agree to open-ended negotiations, uh, negotiations which do not have a complete non-nuclear Korean Peninsula as a goal. So we are saying that um, North Korea should say that um, you know, when certain conditions meet, that's my words, when time comes, they are ready and willing to uh, completely give away nuclear weapons programs for a heavy price, you know, for that matter. But if we do not have that commitment from Pyongyang and just an open up dialogue, uh, not dialogue, negotiations, uh, then negotiations will not be productive. That's our concern. Now, uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said that um, you know, he is willing to uh, open up, uh, or willing to sit down with North Koreans uh, for a first meeting, not necessarily with that commitment from Pyongyang. They can talk about the size of the table, shape of the table, or the weather of that particular day. Um, so that's one idea, and I, I think it's okay. I mean, the getting down to, the, um, to check if North Korea is ready to talk about denuclearization, I think it's okay. Yeah. But, um, but um, uh, you have to be very, very serious and sanguine about the ongoing negotiations. So conversation is okay, but negotiation will have to begin with commitment from North Korea to go free with nuclear weapons when their conditions are met, when time comes, when they, when they feel ready, you know. Uh, whatever conditions, that's for negotiations, but um, at least they'll have to say that they are ready to talk about denuclearization. I mean, that's the minimum, minimum requirement. We used to have much tougher conditions, actually, especially after the crumbling of the leap day agreement I introduced to you. And um, at that time, Obama administration uh, insists that since North Korean wars cannot be trusted, uh, not only North Korea make a commitment that they go, uh, go free with nuclear weapons, but also they'll have to uh, do some actions to give some credence to their words. So tougher conditions, and Rex Tillerson's conditions are kind of less tough, but at the same time, the bottom line hasn't changed, I think, and that is they are ready to talk about, we are ready to talk about denuclearization. If North Korea refuses, now North Korea is refusing to talk about denuclearization, then uh, not a lot of basis for dialogue, I think. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, well, I think most of the things that we saw in the presentation was about North Korean contribution to the agreement, but we didn't really go through the United States contribution to the agreement and the progress that they had towards the agreement. From what I know that I did the research is that U.S. Congress control changed after the agreement signed by North Korea, and the Republican Party here, who were the people who did not really support the agreement, and the funding for the KEDO plant was kind of stopped for North Korea. Funding and for, sorry? Funding for? For the KEDO. Ah, KEDO, I see. Yeah, okay, Kedo. got it. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think about the contribution of the United States to this agreement? And like, because hmm. the same thing is also happening with the Iranian agreement. The United States kind of stopped their hmm. progress after the Trump administration. Uh, do you think after all this happening, North Korea can trust the United States and start talks again with the six party hmm. The um, um, I would say that um, North Korea doesn't trust anybody. Um, like any other country should trust the other country. <laughs> so we'll have to very, I mean, for one, uh, responsible for uh, issues of national security. One will always uh, has to be prudent and careful. And that's our job requirement, I think. Now, the, um, first of all, back in 1994, North Korea froze the agreement. At that time, North Korea did not develop the nuclear weapons. 
they froze the agreement, and as I said, in nine or ten years, they would come clean on suspicions of cheating. Um, if this agreement was implemented to the final destination, uh, we would have solved the problem. And uh, it, uh, crum it has crumbled uh, from the, our point of view. It's because of the enrichment. North Korea first denied that they went into enrichment. North Korea finally admitted that they did enrichment now, right? They showed the enrichment facility to a US scientist named Siegfried Hacker in 2000, I think, 2012 or 2011. So um, if you add one and one, then you will understand that this enrichment facility cannot be built in six months. So logically, <laughs> If they have this, this, this facility, enrichment facility, this means that they have began, they have, they began to build this facility from years ago. So they cheated on the agreement. I mean, there is no denying. So that's why the agreement uh, was not uh, implemented to the full, to the fullest. In the leap day agreement, same thing, satellite launch, the six-party talks agreement, the same thing. They couldn't even agree on a durable implementation agreements. So that's, that's what happened. Now, from the North Korean standpoint for a while, let's talk about it. Having been engaged with uh, negotiations with North Korea for several years myself, I thought that North Korea is, is having a strategic dilemma. And the strategic dilemma is this. Uh, on appearance, on the surface, North Korea claims that they, they, their people are so happy, the happiest people in the world. The only problem is that the threat from the outside, threat from without, especially United States threat, so as long as United States stopped threatening North Korea, they call it hostile policy, and then remove the economic sanctions they imposed, US imposed on North Korea, North Korea has no reason to pursue nuclear weapons, right? So US has done uh, several things, like they sent a presidential letter to, the, to, to North Korea that um, actually US is not pursuing hostile policy. U.S. is not threatening North Korea. 2005 joint statement, U.S. again uh, made a commitment that they had no intention to attack or threaten North Korea, right? And then the uh, diplomatic normalization, economic assistance, all confidence building measures, I mean, that's what, something that North Korea needs, and the other parties are willing to provide uh, those quid pro quos to North Korea. Having said all this, my personal belief is this. North Korean negotiators claimed the threat comes from outside. But they, they know deep inside that actually the threat, exist, existential threat for North Korean regime comes from within. Nobody is interested in invading North Korea. We are not interested in invading North Korea. So the threat for regime survival in North Korea comes from within, comes from their own people. So it's about good governance rather than preventing invasion. And then, so you know that, if, if you assume that I'm right, then how do you, how, what kind of demands you can have to make sure that regime survival is ensured? In other words, the threat is fundamentally from outside. You can only demand something from the outside like, you know, economic assistance, diplomatic relations, building um, the light water reactors, um, providing fuel oil, providing electricity, we offer that too. So they can have all they want. They can have all they want. But still, their fundamental concern is not solved. That is, what about the North Korean people's 
potential dissatisfaction with the regime. That is the core threat. So my point is this. North Korea will have to take chances as we take, will have to take, take chances. Same thing. We have to take a chance and uh, go into negotiations, incredible agreement, and then try our best to make sure that this agreement is implemented in full. Still being aware that North Korea can cheat any time, right? North Korea will have to take chances, same thing. That is, they know that the fundamental threat comes from inside, but there is no way that outside world can help allay that concern. It's North Korean government's job to address North Korean people's concerns. We can help by providing them with economic assistance and other things. With that, North Korean government will have to take chances that um, maybe it's the best way to, uh, to pursue because uh, going on a present course, perhaps inevitably North Korean people's dissatisfaction comes to a boil. So perhaps it's better for us to put a halt on North nuclear program and get this economic assistance and try to satisfy North Korean people's needs. So we'll have to take chances and they'll have to take chances. And yes, as some people say, that North Korean, for North Korean people is a matter of survival. So it's a difficult decision to make. So in short, I would say that um, Yes, they want things from us and from the United States. And I believe the U.S. is ready to talk about those things. But even after the U.S. has given all the things North Korea wanted, still, the fundamental threat for North Korean regime comes from their people. And that's, the, that's, the, that's something that they'll have to address themselves, fundamentally. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. <coughs> My question is also similar to what uh, the previous student asked. My question is about the US interest in the region. I believe that uh, the United States needs to be in East Asia and needs to be in the Korean, uh, here in the Korea and have the military base. So in order to have the military base, they need somehow, they know they do not need the, the South Korean nuclear reunification uh, as the President Chan with the South Korean even mentioned in the program that like, they are taking billions of weapons and aircraft to South Korea and also they are controlling China's influence in the region. Do you think despite having this much uh, regional interest in, to control one of the biggest rivals which is China in terms of economy, in terms of military. They really want to help South Korea, or they really love South Korea to help all the Korean to, to reunify. Uh, I've seen also in a video that uh, former U.S. Uh, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, said that we, we do not really want to uh, bring reunification in the Korean Peninsula because we have regional interest and by having reunification we <coughs> can lose the control over in the region. So what's your understanding? The Korean people have always questions in their minds that is um, any country, any important country will support unification, right? So that means United States, Japan, China and Russia and other countries too. And our job is to make sure that all these countries support unification. That's our job. Kind of walking away from the problem is not our option. Going to the problem is our option. So what I'm saying is that um, these US intentions will have to be tested. And uh, as intentions of other countries tested. And U.S., um, I think, is a democracy. And U.S. believes that their policies are always right. <laughs> so uh, going for unification is something right. 
So it will be difficult for U.S. administration to oppose unification. Uh, and our diplomats, the Korean diplomats, will have to work to make that happen. And um, I'm not terribly concerned about the possibility having experienced U.S. policies. Not that uh, I am naive or, or relieved or reassured, but at the same time, the um, U.S., Japan, even China, and Russia too, I think um, fundamentally supports the idea of unification, fundamentally because unification is a desired goal of the Korean people. No power wants to stand in the way of Korean people accomplishing their will and their goal, and it's the right thing too. So the job is to make sure that these will turn into practical policies on the part of these powers. Now, the, my Russian colleagues actually are saying to me, I mean, he has a point too, that is, of all these powers, perhaps Russia is the one truly supportive of Korea's unification. And he actually give, give, have given me the reasons, but um, it's too much time. But I, I believe him, uh, I believe him. And um, the other thing, um, the, when Germany is reunited, right, uh, some countries are not terribly happy about the prospect, and you all know that as student of diplomacy. And the Korean unification probably is the same thing, and uh, some wouldn't be terribly happy with that. But that is no reason for us to stop working for the unification. And the coupled with the fact, coupled with the fact that um, uh, unification by uh, North Korean terms is probably not a practical option today. That was an option several decades ago, but not an option today. Uh, we can also use this reality that is South Korean initiated unification is perhaps the only practical unification. So even if one party does not cooperate fully with unification, that doesn't mean that Korea will not be united. If Korea is united in spite of maybe one, one party's opposition, and this party, of course, uh, will have some consequences to bear after Korea is successfully unified. So finally, I want to say that um, the U.S. current administration uh, publicly said that uh, U.S. is not going to pursue, or U.S. is not going to, it's not U.S. interest to pursue a early unification of the Korean Peninsula, right? As long as North Korean nuclear problem is being solved, and I personally believe uh, that's against our own interests. So we have some talk to do with the United States administration, I believe. That's my personal conviction. But it also says, uh, emphasizes that the other point, that is, U.S. is actually very, very ready to talk about nuclear issue with China and with North Korea. So if North Korea is getting ready to talk about getting into negotiations. I think um, the stage for negotiation, negotiation is set. And that is exactly why I'm more concerned about the eventual outcome of the negotiation, um, lest this outcome is undermining, undermining Korea's national security interests. Thank you. Maybe the last question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, my question is simple. Uh, I'm just wondering, well, uh, I've been here for a while, and this issue of uh, North Korea uh, uh, increasing their nuclear uh, arsenal is quite big. That issue is quite big. I'm just wondering, what, what could be the reasons behind it? It's very, I think it's very easy to judge them, right? It's very 
easy to judge and I think at the beginning I was too quick with the judging because it goes against, I guess, common sense and anyways. Uh, but in your own opinion, what could be the reasons behind North Korea's nuclear plur yeah, nuclear arsenal proliferation? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe that the fundamental, most basic reason for nuclear development is the regime survival. Okay. The regime survival is the probably the reason, but it is a very dangerous for our, from our position to assume that um, regime survival. It's the only region today. Maybe North Korea begins, began with regime survival as the region for nuclear development. But as you said exactly, their arsenal, nuclear arsenal is more, much more powerful these days than 10 years ago. So even if 10 years ago the region is regime survival, we cannot assume that today that's the only reason. My own personal thinking is that um, North Korea is trying to um, take back a strategic uh, superiority on the Korean Peninsula using these nuclear weapons. If, if they succeed uh, in, um, in U.S. troops withdrawing from the Korean Peninsula, uh, undermining the U.S.-Korea secu mutual security treaty, and then they will really enhance the strategic position. So moving back or withdrawing, or I would say, what can I say? Yeah, uh, regime survival is the fundamental, basic, but probably they pursue much more than that these days. So we'll have to be very concerned about that from the Republic of Korea's standpoint. <coughs> yes. Uh, I just wonder because uh, yesterday uh, the U.S. diplomats told that they will change their policy and diplomacy <coughs> towards North Korea and say that uh, they will be able to talk without any conditions. And so now the United States is like more able to, to discuss with North Korea. But with China and Russia, it will be more uh, easy to talk with North Korea. What do you think about the situation in South Korea? Because we know, both know that the two Koreas are both uh, the biggest enemies. And with the nuclear problem, because we also know that North Korea wouldn't lose its arsenal. So what would be the position uh, of South Korea with this situation? Well, U.S. position is a little uh, confusing. Because Secretary of State Rex Tillerson yesterday said that um, he is ready to meet with North Korea for a one meeting without conditions. But um, several hours later, the uh, White House spokesperson says that the policy of President Trump hasn't changed. And again, several days later, another U.S. government unnamed official said that um, it's not the time for dialogue. They say that. So uh, it's, um, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. It may be uh, a, um, the positions of the government not quite well coordinated. Or it may be, uh, I don't believe that, but it may be the, uh, a, it's well coordinated uh, where person A says this, and person B says that, and try to confuse the other party and try to test the other party. You know, sometimes it happens. But uh, U.S. is a is a is a huge government. So even in the past, um, the um, it takes time for us to really ascertain what U.S. intentions and U.S. policies are. At the end of the day, president makes policies, not secretary. So president's words are more important in this case. President Trump's Twitters are probably more important. We'll have to, we'll have to see. No Twitters as yet but about that. So in any case, there is a debate within the US government 
probably one says that um, you know, we'll have to find a way to open up dialogue with North Korea. And otherwise, we'll be left with really bad options. Right? And the others are saying that um, probably we'll have to open up dialogue, OK, but, but at the same time, it, dialogue has to be about denuclearization and serious dialogue. We cannot be duped again by North Koreans. I mean, that's another voice. So I assume that um, as, uh, as, in, as in so many cases, US government uh, is in a debate about what kind of policies they will pursue. So that's that. Um, the, um, I believe that uh, pe while people talk about military options, again, I believe that military options are so risky uh, it's difficult for any government to take up military options. It's not, easy. it's not very easy. And the other thing is that when, when you talk about military options, there are several kinds of military options. Attacking another, another country is one kind of option. But um, the, um, putting military pressure and um, restricting the other country's freedom this is another area of military options. So military options are not one thing, but there are several ways. I'm sure that given the, uh, the abundance of talent in US government, they have reviewed already all kinds of different options they can take. But whatever options they take, uh, their options, uh, their, their goal is not start a second, new, second Korean war on the peninsula, but try to uh, put pressure on North Korea so that they can draw North Korea into a, um, the negotiations about denuclearization. I think that's what it is. The last part of the question again, I'm, I'm sorry, I just missed. Did I fully answer your question? Or? No, no, it was. OK? OK. So uh, I'd like to say this. Um, that is, as North Korea's threats become so great, uh, the interests of my country, Republic of Korea, and interests of other countries, including the United States, might become different. But this is a very uh, serious time for Korea's diplomat because we'll have to really think from our own perspective, not necessarily other countries' perspective, not even the United States. So that's why I'm saying that um, the um, North Korea's nuclear weapons, they would never give up, they say. I tend to agree with you, by the way. <laughs> well, that will lead to a kind of strategic and nuclear stalemate on the peninsula at the end of the day, if this, this continues. Stalemate doesn't mean that we lose, uh, we give a strategic superiority to North Korea. So I'm interested in preserving the strategic priority even if that means a, um, the sustained uh, nuclear and strategic stalemate on the peninsula. If, as I said, Korea's ability to decide on our fate is undermined by negotiations led by somebody else, and that will be the worst possible outcome for us. So we we'll have to think from our standpoints and all of you come from all different countries, countries I understand, but when it comes to a fundamental national security and economic interests, I mean, you will think, will have to think from your own perspective. However close the other country is to you, it's not identical all the time. So that's, uh, I believe that um, time has come for Korean diplomats to really think, think very hard about our own national interests and structural policies based upon them. That's uh, my last words. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.